Hi guys, this is Matt Granger, that Nikon guy, back for part four of our 50mm Prime shootout. Now, I'm out in the rain. Beautiful thing about using the 50mm 1.2 and the D700. The D700 will take a bit of rain, and this lens has no electronics, so I don't have to worry about frying anything. So, I'll just get a little bit wet for this one. This part, I think, is going to be the most popular of the whole series because it's all about the bokeh. Now, for those of you, I mean, everyone knows what bokeh is. It's those beautiful, creamy, out of focus parts of your shot. Now, just in case you don't know, however, the way to get the best bokeh doesn't just come from the lens. It takes a bit of planning and thinking about your shot to really maximize things. So basically, remember, if you haven't seen it, there, I've got a link here. Depth of field is how much of your shot is gonna be in focus. So it's all those bits that are behind that or in front, but mainly it's behind that we're talking about that are your out of focus parts that are gonna be rendered nice and soft. Now this video looks pretty nice. I'm shooting it on a 105 at F2. That's why it's got a pretty short depth of field. Just behind me is going out of focus and the background is just creamy. So if you wanna do that sort of thing and have the background beautiful and abstract and blurred and soft, one, get the right lens. We're gonna find out which one that is in just a moment. But then two, you wanna have, basically, if you get your camera close to the subject and then from the subject to the background be a long, longer distance, the longer the better, the more out of focus it's going to be. For example, if right behind me, two meters back, there was a tree, it's not gonna be as out of focus as it would be 20 meters behind me, and then it'll just be a blur of green. Then you also wanna think about what exactly you're blurring out. Things like trees are perfect because once they're all blurred out, they just become a green mass. Whereas if it's a bunch of different colors or patches of daylight or whatever, it can still look blotchy and not terribly nice. So I'm gonna pick a couple of things here to demonstrate the bokeh pretty ordinary boring things but just to show you how nice it can be okay now for our first test i've put the video camera onto f4 so you've got a little bit more depth of field and i've set up a simple shot where we've got concrete bricks running along here to the orange and then a few meters back maybe eight or nine meters back is a fence then another fence then another fence and then there's a big distance before the trees so i'll get a shot of that starting out on the 1.8d and I'll show you how it looks at like F11 so you can see the whole scene sharp before we go in and do the little bokeh test. Okay, so that's the whole scene at F11. Now, to make this comparable again, let's first shoot them wide open. So this one will be at 1.8. Nice and bokehlicious to steal someone else's expression. And then we'll shoot at f2.8 just for contrast. Okay, very nice. Now let's try the 1.8G. Again, we're gonna do it wide open, then at 2.8. So here we are at 1.8. And here we are at 2.8. And now the 1.4G. So here we are at 1.4. So that's half a stop faster than 1.8. And you can really see the difference there. Now here we are at 2.8. Very nice. Now let's put on which the lens which will have, you know, there's no arguing about it. It will have the smallest depth of field at f1.2, but how the bokeh is actually rendered is a function of a lot of things, so it may not necessarily be the best overall. So let's have a look at it at 1.2. Okay, now that's beautiful and soft, but I can even see on the screen that it is vignetted. Now let's have a look at 2.8. Now let's look at all of those wide open side by side. So they're titled above to see how much the blur is affecting. Look at the stump of the tree, the fence and then the front of the brickwork you can really see that the amount of blur does increase as you get to faster apertures let's pick another subject you and this time i've got a children's play set set up behind the camera and then a big tree filling up the frame so let me show you how it looked with a really big depth of field okay now again let's try it wide open 
I'm focusing on the 5100 on the front of the camera. And then at 2.8. Okie dokie, here we are on the 1.8G. At f2.8. Next up the 1.4G, shooting it wide open. And now at f2.8, remembering that 2.8 is actually two whole stops slower, so one quarter of the amount of light and a lot greater depth of field. And now the 1.2. Okay, so comparing those, you can really see the difference in the amount of blur in the sections between the leaves in the tree. There's more of a halo and a softening on the ones with a, a bigger aperture, as you would totally expect. Let me take a crop from a particular area that caught my eye on each of those lenses and show you that blown up. So again, they go left to right, and you can see there is kind of a double circle effect on the out of focus areas in between the tree. And as you get up to 1, 4, and 1, 8, they're overlapping so much that it almost fills in the, the white gaps and makes it all green. Of course, other than the beauty of the blur, blur can also be used to distract and isolate things. So there's a shot at f16. There it is at f1.2. That's on the 1.4G at 1.4. That's the 1.8G at 1.8, and that's the 1.8D at 1.8. Hey guys, just a little bit more on how to create beautiful bokeh. A big part of it comes down to the lens itself. How many aperture blades it has, the quality of the lens will have a big deal to do with how the actual blur looks and the shape of out of focus items. But an essential part of it is actually how great your depth of field is. The more out of focus something is, the softer it's going to be in blur. So that has to do with your maximum aperture. So just to give you a little idea how these different lenses compare in terms of their overall depth of field, which is the amount of the shot that's clearly in focus, I've put together some little stats for you. From two meters away at f1.8 on a 50 mil, all assuming FX body and a 50 mil lens, 1.8 will give you 16.7 centimeters of in focus. Now, if you don't know about depth of field, click the link there, but essentially you get one third of that before your focal point and two thirds behind. So 16.7 centimeters. At 1.4, that drops down to 13.3 centimeters. And at 1.2, it drops down to 11.8 centimeters. So, you know, from 1.8 to 1.2, you're dropping about five centimeters or about 30%. So a significant amount. At five meters, 1.8 gives you a meter and seven centimeters. 1.4 only gives you 85 centimeters thereabouts. And 1.2, only about 75 centimeters. So think about that. If you're five meters away from your subject, you focus on their eye, it's giving you about 75 centimeters. So if something's within 50 centimeters behind them, it's still gonna be a little bit sharp, but beyond that, it's gonna be nice and soft. And then at 10 meters, 1.8 gives you 4.46 meters sharp, 1.8 gives you 3.48, and 1.2 gives you 3.08. So there is a significant difference, depending on how fast your maximum aperture is, on how limited a depth of field you can create in your shot. And that's one of the reasons why cinematographers love using really, really fast lenses. When you see a shot where they pull focus and then the background just turns into mush and disappears, that's because they're using a super fast lens. There's a famous old Stanley Kubrick film that was, I think, shot, the whole film was shot on a 1.2, and it, you, it's just beautiful. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to show you in video how each of these lenses perform at their fastest maximum aperture and how it affects the out of focus background. Okay, for this last test of bokeh, here we are shooting video with each of the lenses. So this is the 1.8D and it's focused right on the Nikon by hand because it doesn't autofocus on my 5100. And you can see how nicely blown out the background is on all of that. Pretty nice, huh? Now let's look at the 1.8G. Okay, here we are on the 1.8G, exactly the same settings, just moments later to show you the difference in how that one renders the background out of focus. Next is the 1.4G. 
Okay, there we are on the 1.4G, nice and beautiful. Now to show you why a shallow depth of field in video is good, here I am walking a couple of meters behind the camera and you can see how blurred out I am, that it isn't as big of a distraction as it would be had I been nice and sharp. Now let's check out the 1.2. Okay, and there we are on the 1.2. Um, now it's really coming down in the rain now, but let's do another walk through and see how it looks. I can't see it, but I assume that's nice and soft and blurred. So fast apertures are great. Okay guys, so I hope you enjoyed that installment on Bokeh. Now they do vary a fair bit. I think you can start to see which image was coming from which lens. Um, I have to say overall, I love the blur coming from the 1.2. Uh, 1.4 is really, really nice. Well, they're all nice. You just need to know how to use them. And for those of you who are wondering, bokeh, all it means is blur. It's a Japanese word for blur. So it means those parts that are out of focus. So, you know, you saw how nice and beautiful and soft those backgrounds were. One thing that became really apparent though, on the faster lenses, wide open, there was some really obvious vignetting. Now that's quite common for uh, fast lenses to have that, especially at wide opens. Once you stop them down, half or a full stop, they generally lose that or it reduces significantly. Just looking on the screen, I can see that the 1.2 has it big time at, at 1.2. Um, although I do kind of like the look of it. A lot of people add vignetting in editing for an effect and it's pretty hard to do without it looking like it's been added as an effect. However, when it's there from the lens, there's something about it that seems more natural and right. But still, it is technically a lens flaw to have the, the vignetting around the corners of your frame. So I'm going to do an extra episode in this series to compare the vignetting, shooting all of the lenses against a white wall, a nice scientific test, um, shooting at various apertures so you can see where the vignetting is coming in and out nice and clearly to compare it on these lenses. So guys, click to subscribe, click to like if you found this useful, and um, I'll see you soon. This is Matt Granger, that Nikon guy.